Good morning. Welcome you to God's house this morning. Good to be here in beautiful sunshine, the fall weather. Uh, Tim and I moved the other pulpit back, so if you hear something drop, I'm used to laying things over there. So <laughs> Any announcements this morning? Yes. Uh, when we come today, we're going to have a shower in the fellowship hall for Nicole Dunford from 2 to 4. I hope all the ladies can attend that. Then next Saturday, the uh, Mount Liberty Coming to Free Church in Charlotte is having a get together for the ladies to learn how to do a certain project. And Carla Mead has asked me about her number by today. Who's going to attend that? Kim has said she can drive three people in her car. I just can take five and nine. So if you'd like to go, please let me know by the day because if we don't let her know, we, she may have to cancel it. So just let me know if you plan to attend that. And if you're worried about getting some fabric, they have nice little bundles like this at Walmart for $6. Nice little strips of fabric that we can use. So just let me know if you can go, please. Thank you. Other announcements? Yeah, if you're choosing fabric, darker is better for the project that we're going to do. But we may have enough fabric. But if it's light, that there's a use for that too. But if the majority of it's dark, that's great. Friday night, we're having a weenie roast out at the shed. So um, we're thinking of it like a weenie potluck. So bring something that goes with a weenie roast. If you want to bring weenies or buns or drinks or stuff to make s'mores or some other dessert, because not I guess not everybody likes s'mores, but just gonna have a good time of fellowship. Invite your grandkids, invite your neighbors. Uh, I'm gonna invite all the people who have bought houses in this area. So come ready to love on people that you might not have seen in a while or ever. So that's gonna be really fun. We'll get started about six o'clock Friday night. Also, just, it, well, bring your own weenie, or, or you know, somebody's gonna bring weenies if you can bring one. So, also, just a plug for loaves and fishes. If you if you've been around Cumberland Presbyterian Church for a while, you know this is what we do around Thanksgiving time, and the denomination decides each year where the money's gonna go, and this year it's gonna go for a hot lunch program in Haiti. And, you know, that would have normally been a wonderful thing altogether. And they are really suffering um, food shortage right now. So maybe not just hot lunch, but they may just need to be feeding people, period, not just school hot lunches. So put your quarters, dimes, and nickels there in your 20s and your 100s. And you can put a check in here if you want to, and we'll get it where it needs to go. We'll bring this the Sunday of Thanksgiving. Right, Ginger? Yeah, okay. The Sunday of Thanksgiving. And, and bring those as our offering. So pick up a box on your way out. something for the shut-ins this Christmas. And so if you want to bring things that, you know, could be a Christmas theme or not a Christmas theme, candy, socks, you know, something that would be a nice little we love you basket. Um, some of us who are interested will put that together and take it out to folks who can't come to church but really want to. So think about that between now and Christmas time. Too. Birthdays? One yesterday. But it was
There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. Let's stand together this morning for our said she could sing bass in a quartet this morning, so remember her, and, and we've got some other names to come. Uh, Jason Babbitt has got good news and has to come home, so that's a good thing. Continue to remember Paul Bracey. Thanks, everyone, for your prayers and calls and concerns regarding Gary. Uh, everything's going well, and he starts therapy next week. <coughs> Let us have the procedure tomorrow for some of her ballots. Sue Elston, Jackie Hyde, 
teacher Elizabeth who had brain surgery and we've been praying for her these last few days and she's up looking at her phone this morning so praise God. Let's go before the Lord again. Lord we come as your people called by your name and we say your love endures forever. If it weren't for your love and mercy and kindness Lord where would we be? Where would we be Lord? Open our eyes to that fact today Lord speak to us. We come here to be um, fed by you. We come here to be transformed by you. We come here, Lord, mostly to worship you. Thank you, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that though there are times when we fail you as your people, there are times when we forget your commandments, when we ignore your commandments, when we do what we want to do instead, Lord, when we don't do what we should do, Lord, we ask you to please forgive us. Lord, stir our hearts in obedience to you. Give us strength of will to follow you. We thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. And Lord, thank you that we can bring these that we're concerned about to you. We know that you are able to heal, that you are able to cure, and we ask for that, Lord, but we also ask just for your strength and your mercy. Lord, for all these mentioned, for Miss Brenda, for Jason, for Paul, for Jerry, for Linda, for Denise and Joe, for George and Opus, Lord, for Elizabeth, for Sue and Jackie and Junia, for Don and Janice, Lord, have mercy, for Mary Ellen and Gerald and Sharon, Angela and Danny and Jerry and Matt and Teresa and Glenn and Joy, for Kim, for all the essential workers, Lord, and for teachers, for strength, Lord, have mercy, Lord. We pray for our nation. We pray for our nation's leaders, Lord. We pray that all of us would be sick and tired of turning away from you, Lord. Turn us to you, Lord, as a nation, and forgive us and heal our land. And now, Lord, we just ask that you have your way in this service. Teach us how to be your disciples. And we pray now as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who Lord, art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Stand together this morning, number 539, verses 1, 3, and 4. I will sing.
Will you receive them, Lord, and take them and use them for your glory? In Jesus' name. Yeah, and I believe my seat moved a little bit on that offertory this morning, on this platform right here. Aren't you glad to be redeemed today? Yes. Well, we can do better than that. Aren't you glad to be redeemed today? Yes. Let's proclaim it as we stand hymn number 557. <laughs> Open my heart, that's 
generously she'd been treated there. <clears throat> so we pick up for the first let's pray. Lord, we love your word. We love you. We pray, Father, you just apply it where we need it in our hearts today. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Verse 19. So her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin, a kinsman redeemer. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay close by my servants until they have finished all my harvest. <coughs> Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women. Otherwise you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests. And she lived with her mother the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This story I'm about to tell appeared a few times in our daily bread over the years. There was a little boy named Jack who built a sailboat. And he took it to the lake and launched it to see if it would work. 
Sure enough, the breeze filled the little sail he'd made, and off it went. But before Jack knew it, it, the boat was out of reach. He waded in quickly, but he could not grab it in time. And as he watched it float away, he hoped maybe the breeze would shift and it would come back, sailing back to him. But instead, he watched it go farther and farther until it was gone. And sometime later, little Jack was downtown and walked past a second-hand store. And there in the window, he saw his boat. He ran and he said to the owner, that's my boat. And Jack walked to the window and picked it up and started to leave with it. And the owner of the shop said, whoa, Nellie, that's my boat. I bought it from someone. And Jack cried, no, it's my boat. I made it, see? And he showed him the little scratches and the marks where he'd hammered and filed it. And the man said, I'm sorry, son. If you want it, you have to pay for it. And Jack didn't have any money. But he worked hard and he saved up. And finally, one day, he had enough. And he went in and bought the little boat. And as he left the store, hugging it close, he sighed, you're my boat. You're twice mine. First, because I made you, and second, because I bought you. This is a story of redemption. It's a word we use a lot in church circles. It's in many of our songs. We just sang all about it. But do we often really think about all that it means? Redemption is first mentioned in the opening chapters of Exodus. God hears the cries of his now enslaved people in Egypt, and he promises to redeem them, to obtain their freedom, and not just that, but to deliver them from cruelty, poverty, and injustice, and lead them into a promised land to meet their every need, and there were many ways to find yourself a slave in those days. One major way was to have your nation and your people fall to a conqueror. And sometimes this happened quickly in the case of war. And sometimes it happened insidiously. And this was the situation in which Abraham's great-great-grandchildren <coughs> find themselves in Egypt. Pharaoh found this once nomadic people conveniently useful as a workforce. And over generations, the gap between the rich and powerful and the poor and weak grew until one group owned and controlled the other. The second major way you could find yourself a slave was to sell yourself. Or in the case of children and widows, to be sold. And this was in response to the inability to pay a debt. And it was quite common. And in the first case, for an enslaved people, as in Moses' day, and after the exile in Babylon, Persia, with the Jews who returned to Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day, redemption and rescue could come when a king declared you free. And in the second case, if you as an individual were enslaved because of debt and poverty, rescue could happen if a kinsman agreed to pay the debt that you couldn't pay. Slavery, captivity, is so utterly contrary to God's intention for his people. When God gives Moses the law, he tells his people, this redemption is their duty. In both cases, nation or person, the one who rescues the slave is a redeemer. Rescuing a nation or paying a captive's ransom or a slave's price of freedom is known as redemption. And all through scriptures, we see story after story of redemption. 
In the book of Exodus, God says he will redeem his people. He is a king who can declare them free. And in the New Testament, he is a father who can arrange a ransom. And Jesus is the Lamb of God whose sacrifice pays the ultimate debt that we cannot pay. Ruth is a story of redemption. In its four little chapters, 85 verses, and the word redeem, gael, or redeemer, goel, is used 20 times. It's the same word used for God in the very familiar Psalm 19. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In other words, God, you are my rescuer. And the story of Ruth unfolds, we see unmistakably God's hand. Remember from last week, in the first chapter, we find Naomi widowed and starving. Her husband, Elimelech, and her sons have died. And she's traveling home from Moab to find her family back in Bethlehem. And her son's wife, Ruth, a Moabite, declares she will stay with Naomi and become knitted to her faith. And she says, your God will be my God. And neither of these women has much hope. But Ruth has extraordinary faithfulness. And as we said last week, just watch what God will do with faithfulness. Watch God work. In our story, God provides a barley harvest. And barley is the first of all the grains to ripen. And it will grow in the worst soil. So barley is like hope for the hopeless. Ruth and Naomi come home during the barley harvest. And remember, there's been a famine. That's why they were in Moab. So faithful, loving, resourceful Ruth decides to go and glean in the barley fields. Now this was okay, but it was probably pretty humiliating for those who did it. God's law put in this provision not to glean your fields to the very edges and pick it clean, but to leave some for the poor. Don't take it all. Leave some for the poor. So what Ruth does is okay, but it probably took a little courage. Watch God work. Chapter 2, verse 4. As it happened, Ruth came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Watch God. It's clear as you read the first, these four chapters of Ruth, that Boaz is a righteous and compassionate man. He notices Ruth. He knows the story of her love for Naomi. And he makes sure she has shown great kindness and extreme generosity and compassion, given protection. And Naomi hears whose fields Ruth has worked, and she praises God. Do you ever have one of those moments when the veil is pulled back and you see how God is working all things together? This was it, our reading today. And hope comes alive. And Naomi sees where God is taking the story of Ruth's faithfulness. And where it leads is redemption. Boaz says, I will love you and provide for your every need. And that's what a redeemer says. Ruth and Boaz marry and have a son. And Naomi's family is restored. Redeemed. And we are redeemed because Ruth's son is named Obed. 
the father of Jesse, the father of David. And we are like Naomi because our redemption is possible because of another's extreme faithfulness. And we can be like Ruth. Ruth's faithfulness has miraculous ripple effect. Indeed, we find that she is the great, great, and add a few more greats, grandmother of Jesus. Sometimes we need to stop and think of the state we were in without Jesus. When you're raised in the church, you might not be able to remember a time when you didn't know about Jesus. But when was it that you began to know Jesus? When was it that you began to trust him to step your foot where your eyes couldn't yet see? Have you yet? Sometimes we need to stop and think that we were a people conquered by a fierce enemy. We struggle in a battle still. Though we know the ultimate outcome, our king was victorious. And he says, we are set free. And sometimes we need to stop and think that we were those who had a debt we could not pay. We have sinful hearts, flesh that wants its way, and a world that tells us lies every moment. God's holiness cannot look on our sin. We were held ransom, but Jesus paid it all. Jesus is our redeemer by his own shed blood. So if you stop and think about what that means, what a price, what a gift, if we really get it, it has to stir our hearts. We'll get what David is telling us in Psalm 107. We just read it earlier. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Jesus did that for us. Oh, how he loves us. He is worthy to receive all thanks and glory and honor and power and praise. Not just today, but every day. Present yourselves as living sacrifices because that's what Jesus did. How do we do that? When the flesh starts bossing you around the minute you open your eyes. When the world starts jerking you around the minute you open your door. The minute you open your laptop. Turn on your TV. When the enemy whispers such lies about who God is and isn't. What God will do and won't do. About whose you are. How do we live our Redemption. Like Ruth, we stand by the one who is broken. We walk, we wait. We are radically faithful. We do what takes a little courage to do. How do we live our redemption? Like Naomi. We see that we don't know God's plan, but we trust that he does. And we give thanks. How do we live our redemption? Like Boaz, we see the goodness in others. We're kind. And when we know we're hearing the tap tap, we come to the rescue. And we say, I will love you and meet your needs. How do we live our redemption? Our shepherd leads us. The spirit lights our path. Our creator made us for freedom and sets us free. Even when we're the ones 
who sold ourselves into slavery. How do we live our redemption? We can live it because of Emmanuel, God in us, our Redeemer, living through us. He made us and he bought us. We're twice his. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so with our whole lives. Use words if necessary. Amen. Amen. Amen.